after i think we should go ahead and get started um a little bit of just zoom etiquette please stay muted unless you're speaking so that we don't get all kinds of background interference noise um, i would like to welcome everybody to our meeting uh, i am gail christie from first congregational christian church of christ in chesterfield one of the two co-chairs of the Virginia Justice and Witness Action Network. Um, and then I'm going to let our other co-chair, Arlene, introduce herself. You need to unmute yourself, Arlene. <laughs> um, Arlene Spinelli, uh, UCC, uh, Rock Spring in Arlington, Virginia. Great. And we do have some new faces here today. So if we could just take a minute to go around and everybody in turn introduce themselves. I guess I will just call on people going around my screen. Uh, David Denham, can you unmute and introduce yourself? Hello everyone, David Denham from Roanoke, uh, pastor of Tree of Life Church, and, and we're in the Shenandoah Association. So we're looking forward to doing some networking from here. Great to have you with us. Okay, Leslie? Need to unmute. Yeah, yeah. sure. Leslie Atkins uh, from uh, Rock Spring UCC in Arlington, Virginia. Great. Uh, Britt? Hi, I'm Britt uh, Weaver from Emmaus uh, United Church of Christ over in Vienna, Virginia. Okay, Jean? Jean Wheelock from Little River United Church of Christ in Annandale, Virginia. Welcome. Don. Hi there, Pastor Don Jefferson from Hope United Church of Christ in Alexandria. There, I'm the Minister for Mission and Justice. Great. Laurie? Laurie Forbes, also from Emmaus UCC in Vienna, Virginia. And Sarah. Hi, everyone. Sarah Yurko. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the Mission and Social Justice Team Lead at Hope UCC with Pastor Don. Welcome. And Kathy. Invisible Kathy. <laughs> we can't hear you. Kathy lives in a part of Virginia where the internet connection is not good. <laughs> I, I'm having problems. I can't get my video to work and I had to log out and log back on. I'm not going in the normal way because I didn't get the. Oh, lost you again. Anyway, Kathy's with St. John's United Church of Christ in Richmond. <laughs> and we're glad she's here. Oh, she she needs the link. Um, okay, hang on a sec. Marvin, do you you wanted to say a few words at the beginning? So if you want to do that now, I will go find the link and send it to Kathy. Okay, thank you, Gail. Good evening, everyone, and thank you to uh, both Gail and Arlene for their leadership for the Justice and Witness Action Network, uh, Virginia. It's good to see you, David. It's good to see you, Leslie. Britt, it's good to meet you. I haven't met you before. Jean, it's good to see you. Same dog, thank you. And thank you for preaching at People's this past Sunday. Lori, good evening. Sarah, good to see you. And Kathy, I hope to see your face soon. Um, I wanted to just take a few moments and uh, express thanks to uh, this uh, organizing team of the Justice and Witness Action Network, Virginia. Uh, for many of you, as you know, uh, our Justice and Witness Action uh, Network of the conference is organized by uh, state, where we have several state action networks, and Virginia has been active now for uh, since 2020 as it was emerging as part of the Faith and Democracy 2020 campaign, and has spent uh, subsequent years uh, working uh, at the beginning of the year around legislative campaigns uh, at the state level. And part of the process is representatives from uh, local churches uh, come together 
uh, to discuss priorities and have an opportunity to uh, develop a set of priorities that would be the focus of the collective work of those congregations as part of the Justice and Witness Action Network, Virginia. So thank you for your ongoing leadership and for your commitment to the issues that we will learn a little bit more about this evening, particularly around limiting solitary confinement, which was an issue that you worked on last year. And also uh, the organizing team uh, in consultation with uh, several leaders uh, within our churches decided that uh, there was another important issue that was an emerging that uh, sort of fits into sort of our background as the United Church of Christ. And that was ending the same sex marriage ban uh, within the Virginia state constitution. Uh, so you will learn a lot about these two issues tonight. I want to thank those of you who have signed on to the clergy letter to limit solitary confinement. I believe our partners at Virginia Interfaith Center for Public Policy has that in hand, and they're going to deliver that on our behalf. And tomorrow morning, I will be sending that out via Twitter to make sure that both the Virginia House and Virginia Senate receive uh, our letter from our clergy uh, and see if there are some other ways in which we can get it out into the public. So those are some early things that have been uh, done, uh, but I'm pretty sure there's more activity that uh, this organizing team would love to engage uh, you and uh, people in your congregations uh, in around these two priorities for this year. So again, thank you, and I'm looking forward to working with uh, you this year. I'll turn it back over to you, Gail. Thank you, Marvin. We're going to start with the presentation from Arlene on how the Virginia legislature works since it's it's a lightning fast session and a lot of people aren't familiar with the nuts and bolts of how legislation moves through the legislature. And it's sort of critical to have an understanding of that if we're gonna be effective in advocating for the legislation that we're trying to push. So I'll turn it over to Arlene. Okay, thanks, Gail. Um, first, if anybody, you know, hold questions till the end, and um, I'm, I'll try to answer as many as I can if, if you do have any. But um, some of you may already know some of this information, um, but I thought I'd just go over and, and start with basics so we're all, um, you know, on the same page here. Um, so the Virginia General Assembly dates back to 1619 um, with the establishment of the House of Burgesses at Jamestown. So it's one of the longest. Uh, um, bodies of, of uh, legislator. It is a bicameral body, meaning um, two chambers, and it's made up of citizen legislators meeting part time. Uh, they felt that, you know, um, these people shouldn't be full time uh, politicians, that they should be able to go back to their communities, find out what's what the issues are and and do as little legislating as possible. Um, so we have 40 senators in the Senate. They represent approximately, each senator rep represents approximately 200,000 constituents and senators serve a four year term. And we have a hundred house of delegates and each delegate represents approximately 80 to 85,000 constituents and they serve two year terms. So in 2023, all 140 legislators are up for re-election. Um, so you can actually find out, I'm gonna later on put these uh, links in, into the chat. Um, and maybe some of you are familiar with this uh, website, virginiageneralassembly.gov. And you can go there and up the top banner, um, you can find out who's my legislator, put in your address and they'll tell you your state legislators, your federals, et cetera. So the General Assembly um, meets in different types of session. Regular session meets every year beginning the second Wednesday of January. That was January 11th of this year. And this, and in even numbered years, it's a 60 day session. In odd number years, it's, a, well, it says a 30 day, but usually gets extended by through their rules and everything to a 46 day um, session. So this year they're expected to adjourn on February 25th. So we've got a very short period, things move very fast. Um, but the General Assembly can also meet in special sessions, which can be called by the governor or by the General Assembly, their members itself, if there's a two thirds vote in each chamber. Um, 
And then finally, there's the reconvened or veto session. And that comes the sixth Wednesday after adjournment of the regular session. This year, that's April 18th in 2023. And that's where the General Assembly will consider the governor's amendments or vetoes. So they make the bills, they send them to the governor, and then he can do a bunch of stuff with them. So they'll consider that usually takes about a day. Um, so then they move on. So um, getting back to the House of Delegates, their leadership depends on the party makeup. So currently there are 52 Republicans and 48 Democrats. Um, so right now our House Speaker, so they, the Speaker of the House is the presiding officer who gets elected by the members for a two year term. So currently that is Todd Gilbert is the Speaker of the House and he gets to um, appoint members to the standing committees and then also to assign the bills to those committees. He can decide which bill, which things. Um, uh, the, Dem the minority leader is Don Scott and the caucus chair for the Democrats is Charnel Herring. So in the Senate, um, the Lieutenant Governor is the presiding officer, also um, referred to as the President of the Senate. And that person is elected statewide. That's not, they, they don't get appointed by or elected by their members. And that is currently Lieutenant Governor Winsome Sears, who is a Republican. Um, so currently the political makeup in the Senate is 22 Democrats and 18 Republicans. The Lieutenant Governor, presides over, over the session and makes sure things run smoothly, calls on members, you know, helps with morning hour and stuff. Um, but their only real power is to cast a vote in the event of a tie. So Democrats felt it was important to have, you know, a larger majority going into this. Um, and then there's also the pres president pro tem, uh, Senator Lucas, uh, presides if the lieutenant governor is unavailable, but that's mostly a ceremonial role. Um, the current Democratic majority leader is Dick Sasslow, and the Democratic caucus chair is Senator Mamie Locke. The Republican minority leader is Tommy Norman, and there's a co-chair for, for caucus, Ryan McDougall and Mark Obenshane. So then we get to the legislative process. Literally both sessions, long or short, thousands of bills get introduced. And the Virginia legislative process operates similar to the federal system in that it follows the committee process. So bid, um, bills are introduced, let me, let me uh, get through here. So introduction of a bill. Um, bill can originate, Either one, any one of us can, can go to our legislator and say, you know, this is an issue we think is important. So from constituents, businesses, lobbyists, institutions, you know, the, the uh, higher education institution, education institution uh, medical societies, other groups can go to any member in the, any chamber and say, you know, this is an issue I think that needs a, a law or a fix to a law or a new law. So the legislator will then go to the Division of Legislative Services and ask them to draft this law. They give them a, a broad outline of what they think is, is, uh, would address this. The staff attorney will check the existing law and also the constitutionality of the proposed legislation. You may want to do something and you know, it may not be allowed. Um, after that, they'll get a draft back, they'll get the final thing, and then the member will introduce it to the clerks, the Senate clerk or the House clerk. Um, and then the Senate clerk and the House clerk refer the bills to the committees. And I'm sorry, not the House clerk. In the Senate, the clerk has the power to say which committee it goes to. There are 11 Senate committees, but in the House, it's the Speaker of the House who has the power to say which bill goes to which committee. And there are 14 committees in the House. So then we go to the committee process. Um, the committee chair um, has the discretion of which bills to include on the docket. Uh, they may say, no, let's put this one off to the side. I'm not ready to, to hear this. This is a controversial one. This is one, you know. So again, with the political power, you've got different things you can do. But then the committees meet, they, there's a whole schedule that, that um, they'll meet once a week, twice a week. I think twice a week is the most, maybe 
I don't know if the judiciary meets more than twice, but the chief patron will present the legislation to the committee. So the, during a committee meeting, they're asked to come up and say, okay, Senator ABC, present your bill, um, which they do. And then also the, the committee chair will say, okay, are there any members of the public or stakeholders that, that want to um, give comment on this? They're invited to give input on the bill and you, we can do letters, phone calls, emails, or verbal testimony. And when there is verbal testimony, oftentimes the, the chair will say, mainly limit the, the testimony one, two minutes if there's a line or something. Um, but it's all at the discretion of the chair. And meanwhile, then members of the committee can be asking questions based on some of the, you know, um, uh, testimony supporting it. They might go back and say, well, wait, can you explain this further? Can you do this? And oftentimes, you know, it, it's a conversation, not very long, but um, a, a conversation that uh, can, can maybe say, well, gee, I like this, but I don't like that. Um, maybe I'd like to offer an amendment. So amendments could be offered at this time and they get voted on separately, each amendment. You may have three people saying, no, I'd like this. And so each amendment will be separate. So say no amendments are, are, are introduced, the committee then can go and somebody will say, I, I, I move to report the bill, which means let's, let's get a vote on this. Um, and there are several options. The first and most <laughs> desirable would be, you know, a bill gets reported or approved. It's, it's voted in the yeas by the majority. A bill may also be passed by for the day. It's called, you know, just passing by saying, you know, we're not ready to act. Yeah, those, there was a lot of conversation about these amendments. I want to do a little bit more research. I want to, you know, let me talk to this lobbyist or that person to get some more information. So you can pass it by for the day and it will come back on, up on the docket. Um, but it, it needs to be taken up before the deadline, which we'll talk about with crossover. And if it's not, then it, it doesn't ever get, um, it's just left in the committee with no action. A bill can also be incorporated into other legislation. Sometimes and oftentimes there are multiple bills um, with the same intent, and sometimes even with the same language. And that may be, um, you know, a legislator in Northern Virginia, their constituency wants, um, and there's several <laughs> in Northern, you know, they want um, legislation on uh, preventing gun violence. So you may have, you know, up in Northern Virginia, there may be six people that, that want that bill. Uh, that's, that's probably too extreme, but several people may say to the, you know, I, my constituents have been asked for this, I want to show that I'm supportive of this. So I'm putting it in in Arlington. Another person in Vienna is going to do another person in Loudoun. Um, like I said, it doesn't go too far, too, too extreme, but people may put in the same bill with the same intent and sometimes even with the same language. So when they come up to the committee, the committee might even just say, okay, let's incorporate this one into that one, into that one. And it goes by a, a bit of a hierarchy that, um, if the, the party in power, if they have, you know, if there's a re, uh, uh, an opposite member wanting to have the same bill, it'll go to the party in power on, and also it will go to a senior person. If a junior legislator comes in and a senior one has more, it'll get incorporated into the senior. Um, also a bill, so that's one of the other options. A bill can also be referred to another committee. So it'll come out of there. And a bill can also be said, well, you know, we're not ready quite to do this. Let's carry it over to the next next session. Sometimes, I mean, that happened with um, solitary confinement. They were going to do a, a study and everything, carrying it over. It, it didn't quite work out that way, but that is one option. And then of course, the other option is just the bill gets defeated. And there's several ways of doing that as well. You can have an outright vote, yays versus nays. Um, and you can have somebody, they, they did, did this a lot in the House subcommittees because those little subcommittees are like four or five people. And they, they say, okay, I move to, to pass, pass the bill by indefinitely. And no vote is recorded. You don't have to vote yay or nay. So you're never on record saying, yes, I supported this or I oppose that. 
a little bit more gentler version of passing by indefinitely, PBI, is saying, well, just I, I vote, I just lay it on the table. There's actually, there's no vote, there's no motion made. It just gets laid on the table and the bill dies. Um, so those are the ways bill passing and dying, but um, the bills that do pass will now go to the floor of the originating chamber. So House bills go to the House floor, Senate bills. In. So now there's required three readings of a bill. The first reading, basically there's no action. It just gets printed in the calendar that nothing actually gets read. <laughs> um, on the second reading, um, a bill is can be amended on the floor. So you had the committee process that amended it or didn't amend it. Now it's on the floor. You've got a, a larger body looking at this. And there may be people who say, no, I, I want to amend it this way or that way. Um, and the full floor will take a vote on that. And that's also now in the House, on the second reading, the House will debate the bill. So there's a, you know, there's a motion, I like this, I like that, I back and forth. There's, so you make the amendments and then you go back and forth with debate. Then we go to the third reading and that's when members will actually vote to pass or reject the bill. Um, but that's when the Senate debates. The Senate will go back and forth with their pros and cons and everything. Um, but the, the actual vote on a bill will happen on the third reading. So we might see a bill come up, you know, it's on, on Friday. But so the other thing is during those votes, and again, you, you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Somebody may say, Madam President uh, or Mr. Speaker, um, can we pass that bill by for the day? So we think it's going to be voted on and it gets passed. It gets passed. It gets, you know, that happened. So I think with the, with the, um, death penalty bill I, I was watching it just kept you know kept getting pushed off and it was like why are they doing that I, I and I didn't know but they eventually think so okay the bill gets voted on and it's passed now what happens it goes to the other chamber the other um, body to for its consideration and it basically goes through the same committee procedure as it did in the originating body um so now all the Senate bills are in the House, all the House bills are in the Senate, or as they're going. But now we come to February 7th, it's called crossover. It's not always February 7th, but the middle of, this, of the um, session is crossover. And that's a date where it's set in the rules. All the bills in the Senate have to be heard by committee, have to be voted on the floor. And anything that doesn't, is, doesn't, doesn't go any further. If it hasn't been heard, if it's been left in committee, if it hasn't been voted on the floor, it doesn't matter. It, the day is called crossover, goes to the other body. And this year it is February 7th. And that's where it again, then starts the whole process of the committees. So um, except for the budget bill, which I'm gonna talk about later, that, that's got its own little exception. Um, so the bills um, must pass with the same wording in the House. And, okay, so they pass, they must pass the same and then they can go to the governor. Um, let me just come, come back here. Okay, um, if there is difference, they go to a conference committee. And that's you know, generally about three people that's saying, you know, we're so close here. The House passed this bill, Senate passed the bill, but they, you know, the House might have amended it. And they say, okay, well, we want to come back and forth. And they go back. It literally is it's going back and forth, back and forth to say, okay, um, we've now agreed. Here's the new language. Let's vote on the exact language um, from the conference committee. And there's generally about three individuals from each chamber for each bill. So they get approved and now it goes to the governor. So the governor has a few options. He can sign it into law right away. He can amend the bill and return it to the General Assembly. And, and that will be um, at the re veto session, that reconvened session. Um, he can veto the bill or he can take no action. 
So amending the bill will also require two thirds of the chamber's degree. So say you have a bill, he pops on an amendment, it goes to both houses, two thirds have to agree to that. Otherwise the amendment does not pass. Same thing with a veto, you need two thirds of, and that this is on both chambers for it to, 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 to override the veto. And again, if the governor doesn't any, does not do anything, the bill will become law without his signature. And then all approved bills become law on July 1st. So now let me go back and start and talk about the budget process um, because it's, a, it's, it's its own little animal. <laughs> um, in fact, this I was listening to one thing that said, this was on the Senate side, I don't know about the House, but this year alone, there are 791 member budget amendments, totaling amount of $11.5 billion. So, you know, money is the whole thing. Um, so the budget is one of the primary responsibilities of the General Assembly, and some may even say it's the most important responsibility. And some people of faith have actually called it a moral document that this is, you know, you're putting money where your mouth is, and this is the programs that we like, and this is what we want funded. But it is a sticky and it's not very transparent process. So um, Virginia's constitution requires a balanced budget and Virginia operates under a biennial budget cycle every two years. So the governor prepares a budget, a proposed budget bill and introduces it to the general assembly. And that has to be done before December 20th. I don't know why that date, but. Um, so the bill is initially adopted in even numbered years, that was last year, and amended in odd numbers. So that's what's happening this year is all the amendments. So currently be considered are the governor's proposed amendments to the 2022-2024 budget for fiscal years 2023 and 2024. Um, the, the money committees are just a little bit different. In the House of Delegates, the responsibility falls to the House Appropriations Committee. In the Senate, the bill is referred to the Senate Finance and Appropriations. The Senate has combined the revenue and the expenditure functions into one committee. The, the House has two separate ones. So it begins in you know, summer, fall, um, agency budget. Uh, agencies start preparing their budget and submitting their requests to the funding of, uh, for funding to the Department of Planning and Budget. That's PBB. T DPB and DPB then will review those um, requests for accuracy. Uh, they confirm the need for the service and they seek to identify alternative funding sources if appropriate. And again, that takes place during the summer and fall. Then it, they give that to the governor and depending on his policy priorities, again, each, because it's a political animal, um, he'll submit his proposals to the General Assembly. So that that's, they get this budget um, and then they can take some actions on it. And it goes to their money committees, the, the Senate and Finance and the Senate and the House Appropriations. So meanwhile then, Members can also introduce budget amendments, and that can be for uh, different reasons. Um, it can be to, to support their bills, if they have bills that are going to require funding. If they don't have a budget amendment approved, it's not, even if you pass the bill, it doesn't matter, you can't fund it, you know. So you've got to have an accompanying budget amendment. Um, also, a certain locality, you can do them for governments, for certain localities, projects, et cetera, um, may require, you know, uh, or somebody may ask you, can you put this in for this program, even though there's no um, legislation opposed, uh, proposed with it. Um, so they, members will do that. And that's where I'm saying 791 amendments were proposed just this year to the, to the budget that's already been passed. These are just amendments. Um, so then they go to the, the committees and they go really more to the, the subcommittees of these finances. And this is where it gets, um, it, 
opaque. <laughs> I mean, it's just they have these uh, these meetings where the, the subcommittees will sit down, and there's so many, and they'll say, "Yeah, this, this, this," and 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 um, it's very hard to find out what is actually going on in, in the um, the subcommittees of the budgets of the, of the finance committees. But they come back and they then will report. So these subcommittees, you'll have, um, you know, health and human services, you'll have uh, criminal justice, you have education. So they'll come and report to the full committee. And that's going to be done on, it's usually a Sunday. I, and this year, it looks like it's on February 5th. Um, and that's just the subcommittees report to the full committees, this is what we've decided should go forward. There's really no open testimony, nobody filling in with those. It's this sort of subcommittees that say, okay. So the full committee's got the uh, budget. It then goes to the floor um, and they each house gets uh, to vote on its own version. So it's called, I'm trying to think of what, um, Uh, I, I'm trying to think. Oh, the so it's considered on the floor under the one objection rule. That's that's what it is. So now the budget is on the floor, and this is all toward the end of session. And that's you can see the last three, five, four days um, is really all about the budget mostly. Um, so they're under the budget, and as they go, the, the the clerk or the speaker will go through each item and say, "Okay, this." And generally, the it's voted on the floor under the one objection rule. So, um, say item six two four S or something like this comes up, and they'll say, "You know, Mr. Speaker, please can you pull that out of the block?" So that's going to be dealt with separately. And they do vote on, then you can have 100 of them or you can have five of them come out of the block. Um, but they're dealt with on a separate you know, discussion and, and separate vote. Um, so basically then that they get voted on, each those are different amendments and the, the full one in the block. And um, it can take a while, they can go back and forth. So you, you have a Senate then approves a, a budget bill and the House approves a budget bill. And most, over, every time, <laughs> there's gonna be differences. And this is what goes then to conference committee. And again, it's a very opaque uh, uh, process. You get four senior um, senators and four senior House members, and um, they just keep conferring and, and going over and saying, this is a difference, this is a difference. And sometimes, I mean, it can go on. It's actually gone on past when session should end it. Um, but they hopefully will come up with a conference report, which then goes back to both the House and the Senate for final approval. Um, so hopefully it gets, uh, everything gets gets uh, reported back and then they, they vote on it, it's passed and that will then go to the governor. Now he's got another uh, options here. He can sign it. He can veto the entire bill, but he also has a line item veto, or he can recommend amendments. So if he makes amendments or vetoes the bill, it goes back during the recon, that's what the reconvene session is. Um, and it goes back to the consideration of the General Assembly and they go back and forth, back and forth, and hopefully find up with, finally end up with a budget. And when it's passed and it gets enacted into law and goes in effect on July 1 in the even number years, but in the odd number years, the revised budget will go into effect on the day it is approved by the General Assembly. So that's a lot. <laughs> and like I said, the, the, particularly the budget process, is it's, it's not a clear and cut, um, but I'm happy to take any questions if, if anybody's got anything. Gail, what happens if uh, a bill has a budget impact? I mean, can they actually can it actually can the bill itself pass and then not be funded? And yeah. No, a bill if it's got a, a financial impact, once it passes the subcommittee, it has to go to the finance committee. Okay. And 
they have to approve it, which means okay. I guess they have to assure that the, the funding is there for it. Okay. And then it can't go to the floor until it has both. Okay. Right. right. There any other questions for Arlene? I wasn't too confusing. I don't know. <laughs> Sarah has her hand up. Yes, Thank Sarah. You. Um, this was really helpful. Really appreciate it. I was wondering if there was any um, like written summary or anything that you have um, so that we could share it with other folks. I know, um, hope we have a big mission and justice team, but I know um, folks would be really interested in this type of information. So I didn't know if um, you had anything that we'd be able to share since they weren't able to join tonight. Sure, I, I can share my notes. Um... There, you know, I can do that, but I was also going to put in the, into the chat, I'll do this. There are several sites that are really helpful where I got some of this information, others that I, you know, um, well, and just having, I had work down there. So that was the thing. Um, the it's Virginia Assembly, there's, it's almost, there's more information than you need, but yes, I'm, I'd be happy to, to share my notes with, with, uh, I'll, I'll send them to Gail or, or Marvin that can send them out to everybody. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Right. Also, this is being recorded, so presumably people would have access to to watching the recording. Right, Marvin? <laughs> OK, so with with that as background, I'm going to talk about the bills that we're working on and where they are. And now maybe you'll understand a little better where they are in the process and where they have to go. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to start with solitary confinement because that's it's our second year of working on this particular piece of legislation. So as as we know, the extended use of solitary confinement is actually torture. Uh, the Department of Corrections tries to sanitize it. They call it restrictive housing or restorative housing. Um, that doesn't change the fact that it's de facto solitary confinement. It's still going on in our prisons, and it's a fundamental violation of basic human rights. Uh, so this was one of our priorities last year. Bills to limit solitary confinement were introduced in both houses last year with bipartisan support. Um, what we did last year, we, we did an action alert to the Senate prior to their vote on the floor, and the bill passed the Senate. Uh, we had clergy letters and from the UCC clergy and an interfaith clergy letter that were written in support of this legislation. Um, those were delivered to the Virginia Interfaith Center for Public Policy and delivered to members of the legislature. Uh, the House didn't vote on the version of the bill that was submitted to the House of Delegates. They just sat on it and waited until crossover. So they waited for the bill that had passed the Senate to come over to the House. And at that point, they amended the bill. So rather than voting on it, they directed the Department of Corrections to review its use of restorative housing in their correctional facilities. And they passed that bill. Uh, so the Department of Corrections was supposed to do a review in collaboration with the Virginia Coalition on Solitary Confinement, but the Department of Corrections refused to follow federal protocols that required an institutional review board approval for um, human subjects research. So basically, if they were going to get input from inmates, it constituted human subjects research and had to get approval, and they refused to do that. So the Virginia Coalition on Solitary Confinement removed themselves from the review process. The Department of Corrections wrote a review. It's like 87 pages long. It's fairly self-congratulatory. I'm not sure how useful it was as a review document. Um, the Virginia Coalition on Solitary Confinement carried out their own study. Um, I have not heard much reference to either of those studies in discussion in committee. Uh, of this year's bill, and I haven't read them in detail, but I mean, those studies were done as directed and now the bill is back. So 
<coughs> the bill has been reintroduced this year again by Joe Morrissey, who's the chief patron of the bill. I haven't looked carefully to see how it's different from last year's bill. It's not very different. Uh, it was passed by the Senate Rehabilitation and Social Services Committee already. Um, it was, and it has been referred to finance and appropriations. So there was an issue last year and apparently it's recurring this year. I, Arlene listened to some of that discussion, right? Where, where the, the finance or the budget people are claiming that it's gonna cost what, $10 million or something to implement this bill when in fact every place in the country that solitary confinement has been eliminated actually saves a ton of money. So how that's gonna get resolved, I don't know. Uh, but the feeling is that it will pass the Finance and Appropriations Committee. It did last year um, and probably will again this year. <laughs> um, it was not on the agenda as of today. I, hadn't, I haven't seen the agenda for tomorrow yet. But once it gets through Finance and Appropriations, assuming it, it does, it will move to the Senate floor. Um, and at that point, we need to get the action alert out to our network to contact their senators. Uh, we have, as Marvin alluded to, already circulated a clergy letter in support of this bill. Uh, we got, what, 27 signatures, which I thought was pretty good. Uh, and this, that letter has been transmitted to the Virginia Interface Center for printing and distribution um, to legislators. So between last year and this year, the Virginia Interface Center has been working really hard on the members of the House of Delegates who basically killed it last year. Uh, and they have picked up a patron in the House who is a Republican, uh, Glenn Davis. And he actually introduced that bill last Friday, which was the last day to introduce legislation. Um, it's a little bit different than the Senate bill, and I have a an email in to the person at the Virginia Interface Center who's tracking this issue to see what they think about the differences and whether there's anything we need to address um, in that. But the bill does have a co-patron um, in the House who's also a Republican, and just today, uh, the bill was assigned to House Public Safety Subcommittee number two and is on their docket for Thursday morning. So it's always so when a when a bill goes to subcommittee, what you really need are constituents of those specific legislators to contact them and or submission of you know, public testimony from your organization on behalf of the bill. So I think we need to submit a public comment in support of this bill to the subcommittee on Thursday. Now, you know, I've listened to enough of these to the public comment is basically, you know, somebody stands up and says, you know, my name is so-and-so, I'm here representing this organization and we support this bill. Sometimes they say one or two more sentences, but that's basically it. Uh, you know, the, the letters that we submit are, are certainly much longer, but the emails that we're having people send to their legislators are pretty brief. And I don't think that the, the public comment that we would need to make needs to be any longer than, than what's in an email. But I do think we should make one so that we're on, on record. So, I mean, Marvin, we can talk, you know, after this meeting about, you know, what needs to be said. Uh, depending on the committee and the subcommittee, some only take written comments, some only take verbal comments if you show up in person at the hearing, but some allow you to make public comments via Zoom. And I believe this subcommittee does allow public comment via Zoom. So, you know, 
somebody could actually show up quasi in person to make that comment. Gail, you have two questions if you want to take those now. Um, um, have sure. Lori and Kathy. Kathy. Lori, go first. Um, I did some research this afternoon in preparation for the meeting, and I have uh, a document that shows the composition of uh, Subcommittee 2 of the Public Safety yep. Committee with the um, locations of the members. Mm -hmm. I think it would be very important that if we can possibly identify constituents of those members, um, mo a couple of them actually are Northern Virginia. They're they're probably they're the on Democrats. Board. Yeah, I know <laughs> yeah. they're on board anyway. But it doesn't hurt. It do it doesn't right. hurt to tell them. All right. So there's one from. Let's see. Oh, that. Wait a minute. I got to open a different document. Just bear with me for one moment while I uh, find yeah. the other document. But see, a lot of them are not. Potomac Association, right? Well, so, but I yeah. thought that do we not have permission to uh, contact people outside the Potomac Association? Are we not allowed to do that? I mean, I thought we got clergy that weren't in the if if that if that's not doable, I won't talk about it anymore. Well, they're not uh, here, right? <laughs> no, Lori, I think I think the but, if you share the list, that would be important. What I've been doing is. Um, well, well, one thing I would like to do is a follow up to tonight's meeting. Uh, in addition to sharing the resources that have been discussed already, I would like to share that uh, list of the committees. Um, yeah. uh, and if you could provide a list for all those committees, I think that would be great. And then we can share the information for people on how to find their legislators. But what I have been doing is been in direct contact with my counterpart in the Eastern Virginia Association of the Southern Conference to let them know about the campaign and what we're doing. And some of those clergy leaders and members are actually already on our list as a subsequent, uh, as, they're, as they participated in last year's Faith and Democracy campaign. So they're receiving our communications. So I'm trying to figure out what I should do, if anything, given that Thursday is the date that something would need to be done. Should I send this and hope we can find somebody? I can share with this meeting that um well the first uh hope we all know she didn't uh, was she no she wasn't the sub patient i'm sure she's on on board but she's in arlington hope delegate ken plum is my delegate at least for now it's going to change uh after the election but for right now and i would just write him an email and say hope you will vote for it i'm sure he will but it doesn't hurt him to know that his constituent is yeah. paying attention Harrisonburg is not within our group. Let me just look. Okay, so I think it would be important to see if we can find somebody in Virginia Beach, if we possibly can. Delegate Davis is from Virginia Beach. Somebody, ideally a constituent, should send him an email and say, thank you so much for introducing this bill. There is someone else, Green. Green Hall. Yeah, yeah. she's also in Virginia Beach. If we could locate a constituent in Virginia Beach, uh, somehow between now and Thursday to write her an email and uh, did you say she was a co-patron or not if she's no okay well it wouldn't hurt if we could locate somebody to just shoot her an email between now and Thursday saying please vote in favor of this bill the others are probably a hard do Marshall Norge Stewart well they aren't on the subcommittee they are on the subcommittee according to the records I saw um, I just printed out the subcommittee. Um, I've got Batten, Weber. Yeah, Davis, she's in Norge. And Williams, Greenhall, Hope, Plum. Right. Williams, right. Graves, and Wilt. All right. Williams is in Stewart. Probably not doable. Uh, Webert is in Marshall, also probably not doable in two days of trying to find somebody and getting the requisite permissions to see if we can find a constituent who at least say, I care about this issue. So, but we should be able to find somebody in Virginia Beach. Beach. Yeah. Um, and I got Plum, oh, Norfolk. And this is a uh, Delegate Graves, a Democrat in Norfolk, she's probably on board anyway, but if we had any way quickly to locate 
a constituent of hers, it wouldn't, I, I think it would be a useful exercise between now and Thursday when they vote, even if they're not going to vote in favor of it. It's a good thing to let them know their constituents are paying attention and care. That's, yes. I mean, that's the message I want to deliver. The other one's in, Wilt is in Harrisonburg. Um, probably that's, um, that's Shenandoah, I think. Harrisonburg's Shenandoah, but. Okay, so that's, that's, I, I just want to urge somebody to reach out and see if we can find somebody in Virginia Beach that would write to, to um, Davis thanking him and Green Hall asking her to vote in favor. House District 85. That's Green Hall. Okay, then, and those are my, that's what I wanted to um, say. Yeah, so we somehow need to identify the congregations that are in those areas and get in touch with those pastors, right, Marvin? I don't know. If yes, we. Yeah, again, everything that we talked about tonight was sent out as a follow up to those who are on the Zoom and those who are on the list, Virginia Action Network list, uh, which is about uh, 184 people. Uh, to make sure that they can uh, take some, some some early action uh, as bills are being discussed uh, in committee. And again, I'll contact my counterpart, the Eastern Virginia Association Southern Conference to let them know of our work and see if he can help me to identify a pastor or two who could possibly send a, a brief uh, uh, letter or email to uh, those representatives. Right, so, I mean, the hope is that with you know, a, a Republican sponsor and a Republican co-sponsor. And some of the other members of this committee, I know that the Virginia Interface Center has been talking to and has gotten them on board. Uh, May I just have uh, share one other idea? Yep. Call Davis's an aide, his administrative assistant, and say, what can we do to help and identify when we make the call we are the United Church of Christ, Justice and Witness Action Committee. We want to help him. We are so grateful to him. And what can we do? Um, it, it can't hurt <laughs> to make that call. So do you want to call? <laughs> I can't hear you, but I see you nodding. <laughs> So are there other questions about that particular? What's the bill number again? Uh, that bill number is HB 2487. So Lori, I'm just taking some notes here. You're gonna call uh, Delegate Davis's office? To ask what yes, and done. say, I know it's, we know it's coming up. We want to help in any way we can. Uh, what can we do? And I have a feeling that aide's going to say, well, if you know anybody who's a constituent of anybody on the committee, it would be great if you would blah, blah, blah. And maybe you could send somebody down to testify. Oh, that's probably what we're going to hear. Right. <laughs> but I don't know if we can send somebody to test. Did you say they allow Zoom though? They do. They do. For this one, they do. So we need to find um, constituents if we can, but well, they don't else. have to be constituents, right? So we could get that. She'll probably. I'm I'm just projecting what I think the aide will say based on other conversations I've had with legislative right. aides. Okay, I, I will do that, Arlene. I mean, I think we can get somebody to testify. You know, I'm perfectly willing to testify as long as you know I have approved wording to speak. Who and and uh, all right, so Gail, you said you're going to testify. Who has to approve it? This committee or Marvin? I mean, okay, it's quicker if we just say Marvin has to. Approve yeah. <laughs> that hey, between now and Thursday, the that committee is, is not going to. I think I think it'll be a collective sort of let's look at this and make sure it makes sense and yeah. and and do that. Yeah. Again, as I said, it really only has to be you know, I'm here. I'm representing you know the. Justice and Witness Action Network for Virginia, and we support this legislation. There right. could, you know, one sentence about why, but no, we well, we but, did that. We did that sort of technically today on the um, 
Um, Clergy letter. Sex and marriage. Um, oh. Oh, uh, I okay. wrote something up yeah. real quick right. and had Gail to do a final, to be a second eye and do a final look and approval of it. And she got it off to where it needed to go. Right. But, but that, that would be way too long to give his verbal testimony. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, written is just as better too. They they read those. <laughs> well, <laughs> their the aides part. read them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's. So Gail, you'll be willing to testify? Is that? I'm willing to testify. Yeah. Okay. You you know the sign up and everything. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So moving on to our other issue, which is the. Um, removing the Virginia constitutional ban on same-sex marriage. So a little bit of history, this, this constitutional ban was approved by the voters in 2006. Uh, the General Assembly passed a bill in 2021 to ask voters to repeal the amendment, but proposed amendments to Virginia's constitution have to be passed by the legislature two straight years before they can be placed on the ballot. And those two years have to span an election. So it has to be two different legislatures that pass it. So in 2022, a subcommittee in the now Republican led house killed the bill on a six to four vote. So it just died. So it never even came up for a vote um, for the, the second passage. And this is a trick that's used all the time for bills that would clearly pass if they got to the floor. They, they kill them in subcommittee so that they can't come up for a vote. Uh, so the bill that was proposed in 2021 slash 2022 did two things. It struck the language of the amendment and it added some language that mandated the issuing of marriage licenses and recognition of marriages by the Commonwealth. Uh, what is being proposed this year is something narrower, which is simply to strike the language that was added in 2006. And there are a couple of reasons for that. The, the main one of which is that a number of sort of conservative Republicans would agree that this kind of language just doesn't belong in the Constitution. The government should not be in the business of putting moral statements in the Constitution. That's, that's government interference. And there are a couple of conservative Republicans who are actually on board to push this legislation in the house. So the, the sort of clean deletion we think has a pretty good chance of passing. Uh, so the Senate bill introduced by Adam Eben is SJ 242. And that bill has made it through the subcommittee as of today, right, Arlene, <laughs> uh, which means that it will be moving to the Senate floor. Uh, I'm not sure when the first reading is going to be, but it, I suppose theoretically it could be as early as tomorrow, right? It'll, it'll, go to, it'll be reported to the full committee. That was oh, right, right. Yeah. It's got to go to the full committee first. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, this, we don't anticipate this bill having any trouble in the Senate. It passed the Senate last year. Um, the Senate is still controlled by Democrats. Uh, we, we presume it will pass again this year, but we're watching it and we, when it moves to the floor, we will get out an action alert for people to contact their senators. Uh, we did submit, as Marvin indicated, a letter this morning to the members of the subcommittee on behalf of the Justice and Witness Action Network in support of the bill. Uh, and then the House bill is HJ 460. The language is, is identical to the bill in the Senate. It just strikes 
the amendment that was added in 2006. Um, the chief patron is a Republican, Timothy Anderson, um, and Glenn Davis, who's the patron of that solitary confinement bill, um, is the chief co-patron in the House. So again, strong bipartisan support. Don Adams is the other chief co-patron in the House, and there's a, a whole list of patrons. Uh, so that bill has not been assigned to subcommittee yet. So I don't know if they're just sitting on it or just waiting for the Senate bill to come over on crossover since it's the identical language, but we're keeping an eye on that one. Uh, and we're working on getting a clergy letter drafted in support of this bill. Uh, and just, so this is not a, a bill we're, we're actually working on, but people would probably be interested in knowing that there's a second bill that's been submitted by Senator Eben, which includes the provisions that were originally in the amendment that were taken out. So it's basically a bill that says that a marriage between two parties shall be lawful regardless of the sex of such persons, provided that such marriage is not otherwise prohibited. Um, and it says that religious organizations acting in their religious capacity shall have the right to refuse to perform a marriage. Uh, that bill has already passed the Senate as of today. Um, I don't know if there's an equivalent bill in the House or if that one's just going to go on crossover. I haven't actually had time to, to research Gail, that. Gail and Arlene, I think what would be important for folks on the call tonight and for those who are not, if we can get sort of like a, a one pager on each of the issues. Mm -hmm and to specifically give a brief summary of the bills that we support and that we're advocating for passage right. so that people have that and understand sort of the background for why we're working on this and why it's important. Uh, and it can go along with all the other materials that uh, we have developed and the uh, materials that we're using as part of our advocacy. Okay. Um, so another question actually I had for you was how many people should we give access to the Google Drive where you know all, all of this information? <laughs> yeah, when, when when we get those when we get those uh, documents prepared, yeah, we can give folks access to uh, the Google folder uh, so they can access the resources, and it would be good for them to have sort of a copy of the clergy letter. Uh, they can have a copy of the the bill summaries that we are supporting around each issue. Right. We can also provide them with a uh, sample uh, email uh, that we're using, of course, as part of our action alert that they can just go and grab themselves. And then possibly uh, uh, maybe a, uh, a half page, no more than a page of talking points with each of the issues uh, as well. So. And we have to have all this done in the next <laughs> three or four days. Yeah, or less, or less. <laughs> Not that hard. <laughs> Someone just needs to do it. Arlene? Well, that's I was just going to ask. I don't you've you've laid out all this. Are you willing to do that? I know Lori's been doing some stuff and then Jean, too. So it's trying to get more people involved. Is anybody willing to do that as a one pager? Um, so, Jean, you put together the stuff on solitary confinement, right? Yes. So could you do a sort of one pager? Um, I can try. I'm having gum surgery tomorrow. I oh. <laughs> not sure how great I'll feel, but we'll see. <laughs> okay, you know, you can shoot me an email to find out, you know, where stuff stands. So that's a moving target. Um, what, is, what is the one pager? It might be I could fit it in. Uh, I mean, this call to Davis isn't that long. I, I might have a little time, but I'm trying to put something in the chat to tell everybody, the members of the subcommittee too, so I kind of missed <laughs> what it is that the one pager is supposed to do. Yeah, the, the, yeah. Um, what, what, what would be good to have is a one pager on each issue that gives sort of a brief paragraph on why the issue is important. And then another paragraph 
sort of outlining uh, and giving a summary of the bill that we support and why we're asking for passage. So that's okay. good information as a follow-up to provide to everyone here on the call, as well as to those in our local churches who we hope would take action. Because not everybody's going to sit and watch this recording, let's be truthful, uh, I, but I, it will be available for those who want to use it. So we got to find multiple ways to communicate with people who receive communications in different ways. Right. So the paragraph about why this is important actually could come right out of the action alert. Because yeah, that's how the action yeah, alert starts. Yeah, right? yeah all, of, all, all of the language we sort of technically have is just a matter of sort of reshaping it and sort of reducing some of it. Uh, as well as the clergy letter uh, can be used as well for our own internal purposes. Okay. When you say each issue, then one issue is solitary confinement, two issues is the constitution. The second one is the constitutional right. amendment. Exactly. I will do the one, the solitary confinement, because okay. that's what I'm working on anyway. If someone okay. else could do the other one, I'll yep. do the other one. I'll do solitary confinement. Okay. And Lori, just send that to me and I'll put it on our letterhead and then make sure it gets in the folder and send a link out to everyone so they can access the materials. Okay. And I will, I'm going to mention the House bill number and the Senate bill number in mm -hmm. that. Yep. communication. I'm not going to say where they are because that's changing. <laughs> change. Exactly. No, yeah. We don't okay. need that. Nope. House bill number, Senate bill number, <laughs> why, why we support it, yep. uh, what we're trying to do. Okay. Yep. Got it. I will do that. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Kathy, I see your hand up. Yeah, if there are any things where they are in committee or subcommittee and there are specific legislators um, that we should contact, that would be helpful to know too. So a target list. Yeah, Lori sort of started that process in terms of letting us know which committee members would be good for us <laughs> to contact. Yeah. So uh, if she has that list or if there's anyone else want to pull that list together of the committees where these bills are located, then we can create another document with just a list of the committees that right. are reviewing these bills and the list of the members and maybe even highlight the ones that we feel are important for people to contact. I'm putting in the chat right now, subcommittee two, the one that we got to do something by Thursday, <laughs> because I think Marvin said he could send it out. And I'll just, you know, Marvin, if you could just say, okay, so, so I'm going to put the names of all the people on subcommittee two, where they're from and what their district is in the chat. So we can go out, to Marvin's network of uh, people that are in the Justice and Witness Committee as soon as possible. Yeah. Okay. And then I will work on the one pager on uh, solitary confinement. Okay. Is that agreed? Okay. Yeah. So Arlene, can you put the link for LIS in the chat? That would be useful for people. Yeah. No, I, I did, but I'll do it again. Okay. Um, so the, the LIS page, which is not tremendously user friendly, <laughs> uh, is it's legislative information services. It's where they post all of the information about all of the bills. So you can look up any bill by its number or by the patron and see where it is in its process of moving through you know, what subcommittee or what committee, or what the votes were, who voted how. You can look up any committee and any subcommittee and see their membership. Uh, it's all there. It actually is somewhat overwhelming. So yeah. <laughs> you've got to sort of go with what you, you know, what yeah. you want to keep, keep on because there's yeah. tons and tons of information. There's way too much information. But, but if you want to know, you know, where a certain bill is, you can you can look it up there. And if you want to know who's on a certain committee, you can easily look it up there. Lindsay, do you have a question? I can't hear you. You sound like you're underwater. Okay. Can you share in the chat what you wanted to say? Okay, maybe I should look in the chat. Uh, I don't. 
Okay, so I guess the last thing we need to discuss is, is what else we need to do. Uh, I mean, one of the other things that we've talked about in the past, and again, we don't have a lot of time with time being sort of short, is to get letters to the editor in targeted newspapers that would be maybe in the, the districts of some of these legislators. Maybe that's too much to try and do this year. I think it really comes down to sort of, um, I mean, we have the clergy letter. I mean, that could be used as um, uh, something that we can share with uh, newspapers, maybe as a uh, as an op-ed, or we can take the clergy letter, uh, the actual text of the letter, and um, have it uh, submit it as an op-ed, have to just nuance it just a little bit and have mm -hmm. uh, a signer uh, who's willing to submit it uh, and uh, to outlets. I think Lori did some work last year in pulling together a, a brief list of uh, news outlets that we may still have in our 2022 files um, and our, in our G drive that we can probably go back to and uh, review. So uh, I can um, discuss with you, Gail and Arling, if, if we want to figure out how to do that and see if anyone here this evening, based upon where we're submitting that, would be interested in being the, the signer for that op-ed, getting it out. So I don't know, you know what are the newspapers in the Norfolk, Virginia Beach area? That's the Virginia Pilot, I believe. Virginia, okay. it's it's a big newspaper, but widely read in that area. That for sure, because that the letter should thank Davis because he's from Virginia Beach for sure, and we should target. I I believe it's the Virginia Pilot. Let me let me make that sure. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's correct, Lori. I'm looking at your okay. list from last year. You have the Virginia Pilot and Daily Press for Norfolk and Virginia Beach area newspapers. Yeah, and the pilot's the big one. And, and it would be really good if we could get a letter to the editor, to the Virginia pilot, and spotlight Davis for being the patron because he's from that area. Okay, so I just put the I links to the those. I think the two of them are connected. In the, in, the, in the chat. All right. I think the two are connected because every time I get a news headline, in my in my email from one, I get exactly the same news headline from the other one. Yeah, probably so. And I think I, I think can the pilot I is have now. Um, but quick question: Did you all is are we keeping this just UCC for clergy? Okay, that's what I thought. I just well, we we do you. have I think uh, maybe three or four. Uh, non-UCC clergy who signed onto the UCC clergy letter. So I went ahead and added them um, there uh, out of respect for them signing the letter. I think last year there was a, a, a big request from someone on the organizing team that said we really should uh, do an interfaith letter. And they had access to a, a network of interfaith leaders. So that's why we did a separate one. And those who signed the UCC letter, we just added them to the interfaith letter and were able to uh, get some additional uh, uh, clergy, uh, rabbis, and others, uh, imams, uh, to sign on to the interfaith letter. So it was essentially the same letter, just uh, a more, uh, inter uh, it was just an interfaith list of signers. Thank we you. wanted to get this one out a little bit sooner while things were happening in, in, in committee, because we feel like it wasn't important to mobilize the entire network list uh, for the committee work, since things were moving pretty quickly. But we do have an action alert that's on standby, ready to go. So if things come out of the full committee uh, this week or soon thereafter, then we're ready to hit send so, to get that out so that folks can start communicating with their uh, their representative about uh, the bill when it gets to the floor for consideration. Yeah, I mean, it, it's much easier to target an alert to, to go to everybody's delegate or everybody's senator. It's harder to target them specifically to these subcommittee members.
So Marvin, do you know somebody in the Virginia Beach area who might be willing to sign a letter to the editor? Yeah, again, I'm going to contact um, uh, Reverend John um, John, uh, John Myers, uh, the ACM with the Eastern Virginia Association of the Southern Conference, and say, hey, we got an uh, op-ed opportunity. We got also an opportunity to uh, uh, would like to have a clergy person uh, or uh, a leader in the local church to send a direct email to uh, this particular leader uh, in the uh, Virginia legislature to maybe their uh, can, uh, their representative uh, about uh, the bill as it's going to committee. So that's something I'll, I'll be working on tomorrow morning. Uh, again, we have a number of those people who are already on our list from their participation in the Faith and Democracy campaign. So I may be able to just scan the list real quick and see uh, who we have and do some direct outreach. Yeah, I think there are probably plenty of people who would be willing to sign a letter if it was just handed to them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anybody have any other questions or anything else they would like to bring up before we close? I just wanted to um, uh, express um, the importance of... Um, the, again, the communications and, and going to Sarah's point, she mentioned that many ways that Hope UCCs um, sends communications mm -hmm. out to their folks is to their Facebook page. So I um, uh, encourage you all to promote the Networks uh, Justice and Witness Action Network Facebook page. Uh, put that information uh, in, the, in the chat. You can get your uh, local church leaders to, to follow that. We post the action alerts there when we send them out from our uh, our e-advocacy tool called Action Network, uh, so that those who may not be on our list or those who uh, haven't checked their email yet can get information there uh, to take action. Uh, and then it's also important for uh, those in your local church who are not on the list to sign up for the Justice and Witness Action Network list so they can get the action alert directly. And then they can go after they take action. They can also The system also gives them the ability to then share uh, that they took action and share that action uh, alert uh, with their network, either by email, by Twitter, uh, or by Facebook. So that's why it's important to be on the list because they can receive direct communication. And then oftentimes I use that uh, uh, with guidance from the organizing team to send out a set of resources to uh, those on our list so they can stay informed about uh, what's happening and how to use uh, the resources that we have to do the advocacy work. Uh, uh, based upon the constituents and the representatives that they're connected with. Right, and you can also copy those action alerts and post them on your own church's Facebook page. Mm -hmm. Yep, sure can. Mm -hmm. So that's another way to sort of get them going out a little farther. All right. Mm -hmm. Lori? Um, I am... Uh having my keyboard is screwed up and I've got to get my keyboard replaced. I cannot hit my enter key. Does anyone know how I can post something without hitting the enter key? Mm, you should be able to on the bottom right of the chat, there's like a little uh, icon that kind of looks like a paper airplane. You should be able to do that or Okay, let me yeah. see if I can do that. Hold on. I, I'm, I, I'm at the bottom and I don't see a paper airplane. Oh, it's on the lower right. In the chat, in the chat oh, window. In, far lower right. Mm -hmm. Far, far lower right. Basically, it's low right. I can't can. move. I can't move it down any further. <laughs> it just, yeah. Here. No, you shouldn't have to move it down any further. Just like when you're looking at it, when the chat is open, um, like it's the last icon all the way in the far bottom right uh, kind of looks like a paper airplane or a triangle facing like out of the window. The last thing I see, the last line I see is the last line of my text. All right, so here's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> can I put it on a Google Drive or something? Yeah, just, or you can just send it to me. Um, all right, email, I'll, I'll send, the yeah, I'll, I'll just, uh, yeah, I'll just send it to you, Marvin. I'll copy it and put it in a text of an email. Sorry, <laughs> I, I gotta, I gotta do something about this keyboard, but I can't turn my computer over to my 
tech folks because I use it so much. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> sorry. Thank you all for your help. <laughs> okay. Um, would somebody like to pray us out? Yeah, I'll go for it. Thank you. God, we thank you for collaboration. We thank you for intricacies and details. We thank you for people who are doing the hard work of reading the fine print um, in the legislation that is before us. We also thank you for justice, oh God. We thank you for mercy. We thank you for grace and great love that moves us all to find ways to make sure that equity reigns throughout the land. Um, continue to give us direction, um, continue to give us courage and encouragement in order for us to coordinate all of the things that need to happen to liberate your people. Um, may they be people who are incarcerated or confined, may they be people who are queer or even thinking of being married, all of the different ways in which embodied Americanism um, puts our liberties in jeopardy. We ask, oh God, that you would help us keep people free. Um, bless this process and all of the things we're organizing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good night, all. Thank you for Thank coming. Thank you all so much. Be well. Thank you so much. Yes, one last thing.